Right, we're going to have a brief transition here. Panel one is going to get established up in the front. And uh, we actually have somebody on panel one who's going to make administrative law very interesting, I promise. One of the, one of the, leading, uh, one of the leading professors and authors in that field. So just a couple of other things while we're getting settled. Uh, we have asked each panel to address a common question to kind of tie in all the multiple layers of this particular issue. So panel one, their question is, uh, what do you think was the single most significant factor that contributed to the magnitude of the Deepwater Horizon event? And this is an, this, these questions are intended to elicit perhaps some different opinions uh, and, and really kind of nail them down a bit, if you will. Um, one more other housekeeping thing that I do want to note, especially for presenters. School's still in session here at the law school, and the law students will tell you it's a very busy time of year, especially because we had so many snow days this year. So there's lots of makeup classes. So students and faculty will be ebbing in and out throughout the day. Don't be offended. Don't take it personally if you're speaking. And a few people get up and leave. They're just, they're going to school. That's, that's all. And they got to get to class. Um, so without anything else, I'd like to introduce Professor Michael Berger, my good colleague and friend here at the law school. He teaches environmental and ocean and coastal law, law and literature. Uh, he comes from a background of doing environmental compliance in New York. And also, and I didn't know this about this till I read his bio, uh, a background in some journalism. And we have a journalist on this panel. Uh, we, because our schedule is tight, we're not going to do extensive introductions of each speaker. I've asked the moderators to just give you the most salient one or two things so you can ID it. But we have full bios in the program. I encourage you to read the bios and see the impressive backgrounds of each of our speakers. So, Michael. So I'll just, uh, I guess my role here is just to give you the, the brief introduction, and I'm going to introduce the speakers in the order that they're actually going to sp be speaking in, which is neither how they're arrayed here nor how it's laid out in the, in the <laughs> program. Um, and then uh, Susan, I believe, is going to be the taskmaster on the timekeeping, and afterwards we'll open it up for questions, time permitting. So, our first speaker will be Juliet Eilperin, who is the national uh, reporter for the Washington Post and covers environmental uh, and ocean issues and has covered the Gulf oil spill in some detail. Um, following Juliet, we will hear from Sid Shapiro, who is a professor at Wake Forest uh, Law School and also the associate dean of research there. Um, and for those who are in the room who are in my administrative law class, you'll note that uh, Professor Shapiro is one of the casebook authors, and so when I refer in class to, well, what the casebook authors here are saying, um, today is your chance to prove me wrong. <laughs> um, following Professor Shapiro, we'll hear from Steve DuPont, who is an attorney in the Office of Maritime and International Law with the U.S. Coast Guard. Um, then Dave Westerholm, who is the director of NOAA's Office of Response and Restoration. And finally, from Garrett Graves who is the director of the Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority in Louisiana. So it should be fascinating. And Juliet, I'll Great. turn it over to you to get us started. Thank you. So what I'm going to do is essentially put meat on the bones of, of what, for example, Senator Whitehouse was, was talking about without ever using the term regulatory capture. So here, this, this is, you know, because I'm not a lawyer, I'm just a journalist. In the, in the run-up to the Deepwater Horizon explosion, the federal government's Minerals Management Service adopted at least 78 industry-generated standards at federal regulations, according to the American Petroleum Institute, the trade group that, it re that represents the industry. Two weeks after BP's Maconda well blew out in the Gulf of Mexico, MMS finalized a regulation intended to control the undersea pressures that threaten deepwater drilling operations. Like dozens of other rules, it was written by API, and it, the agency only received a couple of comments on the, on the regulation, bo both of which were from industry. One was from the Offshore Operators Committee, uh, and then the other was from BP itself. The regulation stated, BP, a large oil and gas company, expressed the importance of this rule and how they have been involved with MMS and industry to develop the industry standard. That really typifies the kind of cozy relationship that we'll be examining and, and how an agency that was charged by law to, quote, meet the nation's energy needs formed a partnership that had such disastrous results. These, the officials, 
from the top as well as rank and file employees referred to the companies under their observation as clients, customers, and most often partners. They waived hundreds of environmental reviews and didn't aggressively pursue companies for equipment failures. They participated in studies that were funded and done by the industry and its contractors. And when the industry resisted certain proposals, MMS usually jettisoned them, uh, noting that they would increase costs even as they might improve safety. And essentially, this stemmed from the inherent conflict of interest that was embedded in what the agency was doing. It was one of the you know, nation's largest revenue collectors, uh, only second to a couple of agencies, including the IRS. Ironically, MMS was born out of a drive for reform. Uh, for years, the US Geological Survey had been in charge of assessing what our natural resources were when it comes to oil and gas. And, and you know making those making those decisions, but there were allegations of fraud. This was in the late 70s, and so it was James Watt, Ronald Reagan's uh, Interior Secretary, who created the agency in 1982 that would not only lease tracts for exploration and collect the government's share of oil and gas revenues, but and this is this was a key change that Watt made. It would regulate the industry as well, and that is the built-in conflict that the U.S. has been living with ever since. At first, there was this push and pull between regulators and, and in the executive and, and the legislative branch, because essentially Watt under Reagan was pushing for more and more extraction offshore. And he encountered a lot of resistance from actually, a, at that point, a bipartisan coalition in Congress, particularly in New England and the Pacific Northwest. So for example, when he proposed drilling in 81 off the Pacific Outer Continental Shelf and off George's Bank in Massachusetts, obviously not too far from here, it was a couple of members of Congress, Leso Coyne and Silvio, uh, Silvio Conte, who used their post on the House Appropriations Committee to block him. And what happened there is something that I think also bears some examination in terms of what happened in the Gulf, which is that Congress proceeded to impose a series of moratoriums on where drilling could happen. And so, for example, they started by just saying, you know, they, they, that he couldn't drill in those two areas from 82 to 92. The territory that was declared off limits expanded from 700,000 acres off the California coast to more than 266 million acres off the Pacific and Atlantic coast, Alaska's Bering Sea, and the Gulf's eastern portion, the Gulf of Mexico's eastern portion. But all of this put more and more pressure on drilling in the central and western Gulf. And, you know, that has continued to this day. So, you know, this this continued under actually uh, President George H.W. Bush, who expanded the restrictions. He canceled several lease orders by executive order, uh, established a marine uh, sanctuary off California's Monterey Bay, and bought back tracks from South Florida. As a result, today the, the Gulf is home to 99 percent of the nation's offshore oil production of the 911 new wells in the past two years. All but 13 were drilled in the Gulf. And one of the things that's interesting when I started examining this issue in the wake of the BP oil spill was looking at how really this was, it's not just that one party was, was part of this issue, it was actually both. So for example, President Clinton did very little to enhance protections in the Gulf. Uh, his interior department began to emphasize performance-based regulation on the assumption that the industry was better positioned than the government to determine which practices worked. When it came to MMS efforts like this and the reinventing government initiative that was championed by then Vice President Al Gore exacted a cost. For example, MMS was ordered to do a better job of collecting royalties while losing nearly 10% of its staff over the next five years. And so again, that's part of what you really saw happen, that more and more demands were being placed on an agency that not only had a conflict of interest, but simply didn't have the resources, the compensation for its employees to do adequate oversight. Uh, it was in October of 1993, under uh, the Clinton administration, that an interior panel issued findings aimed at future drilling uh, policies called moving beyond conflict to consensus. And this really represented a paradigm shift that continued on uh, for the next decade or two. Uh, it was chaired by an oil drilling company executive. And it urged a reversal of restrictions championed by the previous decade, uh, including by, by Bush and many members of Congress. It you know, recommended interior lift moratoriums, essentially make it easier to drill in the Gulf. 
Uh, less than two years later, the panel, uh, after, after the panel issued these recommendations, Congress got into the act as well by passing the Deepwater Royalty Relief Act, which exempted companies that drilled on certain leases from paying royalties. This was backed particularly by, say, people like J. Bennett Johnston, a senator from Louisiana who consistently championed the cause of oil companies, later became a lobbyist for the American Petroleum Institute, which he still is, as well as uh, sat on the board of a major oil company. And in the end, it was actually MMS, at the end of the Clinton administration, it was MMS itself which issued a warning to Washington. There was a little notice budget document that uh, my colleague Scott Hyam and I discovered in the course of our reporting, uh, where the agency said in, in 2000 that the burgeoning number of deep water wells had made overseeing operations in the Gulf of Mexico more complex. The number of companies had grown from by 30%, and many of the employees were new that were looking at, at the drilling operations. MMS cautioned, the offshore industry significantly downsized in the 1980s. The presence of workers without offshore experience is placing an added burden on the inspection and compliance program. But this did nothing to heed uh, exploration in the Gulf. You know, when George W. Bush came into office, the push for broader oil and gas exploration only accelerated. On January 29th of 2001, shortly after, take nine days after taking office, Bush created the energy task force that his vice president, Richard Cheney, uh, chaired, where, as I'm sure many of you are aware of, they brought in uh, oil and gas executives to provide recommendations, most of which were codified by uh, the Bush administration, either through an executive order or um, through simply policies that the Interior Department pursued under Gail Norton, the Interior Secretary. Um, the report that the Energy Task Force issued on May 16th said that drilling in the Outer Continental Shelf had a, quote, impressive environmental record. Um, and that state and federal regulations were interfering with exploration and needed to be relaxed. Uh, you know, so Norton and her deputy, J. Stephen Griles, embraced this report. Um, that Griles had a, a, issued a memo to the White House Council on Environmental Quality on August 22nd, 2001, and said Interior was, quote, fully committed to playing a role in this effort and that it had, quote, a special interest and expertise in expanding production. And that's exactly what we saw. Um, throughout Norton's tenure, they adopted regulations that made it easier to drill without the same level of environmental oversight. This included, say, for example, uh, rejecting studies that suggested that the blind shear rams, a crucial stopgap measure in the event of uh, failure, should be you know strengthened and reinforced. That wasn't adopted. Um, you know, basically several different things. They also, in 2005, finalized a policy that, again, had been proposed by the Clinton administration, where MMS told companies that they did not have to provide detailed blowout and response scenarios for each exploration plan. This obviously became critical. Sure. That, that became critical later on. Uh, MMS was asking for budget increases, but basically didn't get them. And and then while Interior had talked about uh, how offshore drilling could qualify for environmental exemptions as far back as 1980, it became, this exemption became widened over time. And it's worth looking that, that they did something called the categorical exclusions, where essentially the, anyone proposing to drill did not have to do detailed environmental reviews. Under Clinton, these categorical exclusions granted in the central and western Gulf of Mexico rose from three in 1997 to 795 in 2000. During the Bush administration, MMS granted an average of 650 categorical exclusions. And while it dipped to 220 during the, Bush administra uh, the Obama administration's first year, one went to the Macondo well. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've, you've read about the relationship they had on the ground. Um, one of my favorite quotes from uh, an investigative uh, an inspector general report on the Lake Charles office um, in terms of MMS is that an agency employee who was dating an inspector said her boyfriend told her that the time he and other inspectors spent out on platforms basically amounted to mini vacations. She told agents that inspectors eat like kings, they watch porn, and they take naps. Those were the people who were responsible for looking at the safety on rigs in the Gulf of Mexico. So essentially, uh, I think it's also worth noting that while you know clearly the people see the spill as this one in a million event, 
uh, when you look at the Presidential Oil Spill Commission's report, which came out recently, it identified 79 loss of well control accidents in the Gulf of Mexico between 1996 and 2009. Obviously, they didn't go disastrously wrong, but you can get a sense that there was a problem and this was not just an isolated incident. And I think we can talk about this in the discussion, but one of the things obviously I've been looking at since then is all the different ways that, that basically the Obama administration has sliced and diced the successor, uh, its successor agency, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management Regulation and Enforcement, which is in fact getting split into even more parts in an effort to kind of address this conflict of, of interest. In conclusion, I just wanted to quote Michael R. Bromwich, who's been brought in to chair this, to head this new agency and is overseeing the kind of reform that's going on right now. And in February 11th, he gave an address to the James A. Baker Institute's Energy Forum uh, at Rice in Houston, and he, he raised this fundamental question. The Gulf accounts for more than 25% of domestic oil production and approximately 12% of domestic gas production. One of the key problems that we are addressing and that cannot be avoided is this. How will government and industry make the fundamental reforms necessary to improve safety and environmental protection in this massive industry, while at the same time allowing for the continuity of operations and production? This is the central question that frankly has been facing the federal government since the creation of MMS and is really one of the, the, the key issues that we'll have to navigate in the months and years ahead in order to ensure that it can balance both exploration and safety. Thanks. of things which I probably should have mentioned in advance. Um, one is all the presentations are being recorded and speakers that are using PowerPoint presentations, they will, all, all that will be on our website after the conference. So especially students who are feverishly trying to keep up with taking notes, don't, don't need to worry about it. It's all going to be there for you. Um, and speakers, if you could do our photographer a favor and, and dispense with the happy uh, name tags that we gave you just for <laughs> your speaking, because he, he likes it better without the name tags. All right, I'm going to get your presentation loaded up while you do an intro. Well, I, I'm standing. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's OK. I don't, I don't know what more to add to the intro I already gave. Um, Bam. Vamp it up? OK. Um, I'll tell a story while you're waiting. So um, <laughs> this is about administrative law, right? Um, and it's supposed to be interesting, which is always a real challenge. Uh, its reputation among students is among the most boring courses you could possibly take. Um, Justice Breyer, when he uh, taught administrative law at Harvard, reports he once got a student evaluation. And you know that portion on the bottom after you fill in the little ovals where you get to write? Some uh, student wrote him, uh, Professor Breyer, as he was then, if I only had one day to live, I'd want to spend it in your class where every moment seems like an eternity. <laughs> <laughs> now that I've set myself up for failure. Is this yours? Is this your no. presentation? I th I, I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time finding it. Hang on. Tell another story. That was great. <laughs> Uh, well, let me start my talk without the, uh, the PowerPoint. Um, I uh, had, and you can't count this against my time. Uh, You're good. Here we go. Okay. There we go. So I would like to uh, continue along the theme of uh, regulatory capture, uh, which uh, Senator Whitehouse uh, discussed. and. Uh, because I'm a professor, I'm going to do it slightly differently and a little more theoretically, but um, at the end, we come out about in the same spot. Um, the Gulf oil spill largely was attributed to regulatory failure, and I don't have time to point out the many reasons for that, but I would uh, suggest you might uh, take a look at two reports by the Center for Progressive Reform of which I'm a member and the vice president. Uh, we're a group of about 70 law professors and some other professors across the country with a small Washington staff. And uh, we came out with this report before the commission. Uh, it says many of the same things that uh, Juliet uh, talked about. 
uh, but uh, ties a little more to the law. We have a second report uh, about uh, the topic that will come out this afternoon, which is the civil justice system and uh, potential liability and limits uh, thereof. Uh, if you're more interactive and you want to get some of the same information, here's a really cool map we have. Uh, and when you click on all those little bubbles, uh, you can learn about the intersection of policy uh, and law and regulatory failure uh, in the Gulf. Administrative law is supposed to prevent these things. Um, it's supposed to bring accountability to the regulatory process. And it does that by enabling public interest groups to be watchdogs. Uh, there's various ways that's done, but a primary one is groups get to file comments on proposed regulations and then take agencies to court if the regulations uh, are inadequate. But the reality is there's limited public interest participation and often strong internal agency resistance to what the public interest groups are saying if they even show up. Empirical research shows that regulatory entities, the oil industry and others, file many more comments than public interest groups and attend many more meetings with the agencies. And often, uh, there are no public interest comments, as Julia pointed out, uh, on the last regulation of MMS. The result, then, is a kind of uh, capture where inevitably uh, agency policy gets tilted towards the interests of the regulated entity uh, because of this asymmetry. No matter how much regulators intend to serve the public interest, a process of negative feedbacks will produce shifts towards positions espoused by the regulated industries. Even if regulators are aware of the arguments for strong regulation, they resist it for three reasons. First, when a business-friendly administration is in power, it appoints administrators who are hostile to regulation. Second, because they have to have expertise, agencies often recruit people from the industry being regulated. And there's some resistance to strong regulation because those people intend to go back and work for the very industry they just left. Finally, and most pernicious, there's a kind of deep capture when regulators adopt the point of view of the regulated industry. This can occur because regulators work closely with industry representatives, and as a result, they absorb industry norms. Uh, in our report, we quote an MMS district manager who told an investigator, obviously we're all oil industry. We're all from the same part of the country. Almost all of our inspectors have worked for oil companies out on those same platforms. They grew up in the same town. Some of these people, they've been friends all their life. They've been with these people since they were kids. They've hunted together. They fish together. They skeet together. They do it all the time. Or there may be a structural conflict of interest. This occurs when the same agency is responsible for promotion of the success of the industry and for regulating it. And as Juliet told you, in the case of MMS, its budget was tied to the amount of drilling, creating a huge conflict of interest. So what to do? First, uh, as Senator uh, Whitehouse uh, pointed out, uh, more transparency would be a good idea. Uh, I also support the idea of um, website disclosure. First, I would have agencies uh, have public calendars uh, where every time they have a meeting with anyone, uh, they post the nature of the meeting and a summary of it so those of us on the outside can see what's going on. And secondly, um, as the senator would like to force, it's very important to have statistics on the number of meetings by type of group and the number of comments by type of group. Now earlier I pointed to uh, empirical studies of the rulemaking process 
which demonstrate that industry shows up and for the most part public interest groups do not, uh, those stories are extraordinarily laborious to do because you have to download uh, the entire calendar of comments and meetings um, and then you have to count them all up and categorize them. Uh, moreover, the studies that have been done deal largely with EPA because it's the only agency that actually puts uh, the meetings uh, and summaries of them uh, on its public docket. Uh, so we don't even have that information for other types of agencies. Third, uh, in a book uh, that I recently published with Professor Rena Steinzer um, at uh, Maryland Law School, we recommend uh, that agencies be required to produce what we call indicator reports or positive metrics. And what these things would do is measure the level of regulatory performance. Uh, they'd be hard to do and we want them to be relatively simplistic so uh, they're accessible to the public. But they would do something like reveal key parts of information uh, which would indicate to us over time whether or not regulation is happening or failing. So for example, the FAA has a category of near misses. Uh, when the planes come too close, uh, that has to be reported. Uh, MMS should have had a category of near misses. Uh, so if we can see the number of near misses are going up over time rather than going down over time, it becomes a red flag and then we can begin to investigate the reasons for regulatory failure. It may be capture, it may be other things. Uh, the indicators wouldn't tell us the reasons for failure, but they would alert us to the continuation of failure over time and then Juliet and others could report on it, uh, CPR would notice this and other public interest groups and we could try to do something with it. It's also important to strengthen the uh, public service. Uh, agencies need more resources. Again, um, as reported, uh, MMS resources were actually declining. They had an amazingly few uh, inspectors for all the platforms uh, that they had to uh, cover uh, in the Gulf. Uh, more than that, um, we need more resources so the agencies can uh, hire more professionals. Uh, because if they hired uh, more professionals, then we could slow the revolving door because agencies would have in-house uh, expertise uh, to accomplish that. Uh, next, uh, resources are important because we not only have to um, hire good people, um, we have to retain them. Uh, and this is not a Herculean task. Um, agency budgets, MMS, or actually the totality of the regulatory agencies are uh, account for such a small part of the federal budget that we could adequately fund all of these agencies um, and it wouldn't make one whit of difference really to either the annual budget or the deficit. We've got huge deficit problems, we'll have to solve them but solving them on the back of the regulatory agencies makes no sense at all because they simply don't account for enough of the money that we spend to make any difference at all. Finally, and most deeply, we have to make public service attractive again. We have to be able to recruit people like the young people in this room, make it attractive to become a federal bureaucrat and to stay a federal bureaucrat. And this is going to require some self-restraint on the part of our politicians, so this may be mission impossible. But when every politician in Washington makes it a habit to bash the bureaucracy at every turn, um, it's a little discouraging to go into public service, and it's certainly discouraging to the people who are there who are trying to do a good job under difficult circumstances. Finally, we have to reduce conflicts of interest. Um, you again heard Senator Whitehouse uh, talk about this. Um, and we have laws uh, to do this. We have uh, timeout requirements, for example, uh, wherein uh, people go through the revolving door and they come out the other end. Um, they're supposed to sit out for a certain amount of time. I'm not sure those are terribly well enforced. I'm not sure you can enforce them very well. 
Uh, so it's very important to establish an ethical culture uh, in the agencies and outside the agencies. We need an ethical culture in which a former regulator or a regulator recently hired from industry would refuse to participate in any manner in which they were involved in their former jobs. And then Congress has eliminated the conflict of interest that existed in MMS by creating BOMER, but I think there's still a problem. Uh, at the end of the day, this agency reports to the Secretary of Interior, so that invites his office to become conflicted over the same issues of regulation and obtaining revenue through drilling leases. So I would make BOMER an independent agency in the Department of Interior so that its appointees do not report to the Department of Interior. Uh, there's precedent for that. The Federal Energy Regulatory Commission is an independent agency in the Department of Energy, and we could do the same. So to sum up, um, as the Gulf oil spill proves every day, we can't afford regulatory failure. Addressing regulatory capture is a daunting job. It's time to start. Actually, it's past time to start. Thank you. Thank you, Sid. Um, while we're pulling up the next PowerPoint and um, getting ready to hear from, from Steve, right? Um, I guess I have a quick question, a follow-up question, both for Juliet and for Sid, which is about Bomer. Um, you mentioned, Juliet, during your talk that it had sort of divvied up responsibility, and I guess that for the people in the room who aren't aware of exactly how it's divvied up yeah. among the agencies, it might be good to sort of spell that out a little bit. And then I'm just curious, from each of your perspectives, is it proving effective in addressing either the cultural kind of um, problems that, that you raised, Juliet, or the institutional problems that, that you're raising, should, other than the conflict of interest at the interior level? So, Juliet? Sure. Um, so basically, one thing that they're, they're doing to, to deal with this is that in terms of splitting up, uh, quick summary, um, in October of last year, they put the revenue collection in something called the Office of Natural Resources Revenue, and it was placed in a different part of Interior with a, a chain of command of reporting that's totally different from the offshore uh, regulation. So that's what they've tried to do. And now what they, what in fact, uh, BOM, BOMER, BOMER, as we say, will be actually split again, and it, they're creating two agencies. One's the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, and one's the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement. And so the theory is that if you split off where you're doing safety and environmental enforcement to where you're actually deciding how to do offshore energy exploration, and you have separate chains of commands and so forth, that is is trying to get at this issue. Again, they're all housed within Interior. Um, you know, again, they're doing a lot of things. They're hiring a chief environmental officer. They're, they are, they're doing a nationwide recruiting drive. But basically, you still have an issue, particularly when you're talking about, you know, everyone's obviously been watching what's happened with the budget uh, and the fights there. You know, one thing, again, when we were looking at it, MMS inspectors were paid something like literally a third of what you would get for doing the same job for an, for an oil and gas company. And so, you know, there's just no way that Congress in this environment is going to give them the money to even come close to matching what these people could earn if they're working for the companies as opposed to the federal government. So I think, as Professor Shapiro mentioned, that's a really huge issue that they're grappling with. Uh, well, right now, all eyes are on uh, BOMER and the Department of Interior. So um, for uh, the short time being, and maybe for a couple of years, uh, we're probably not going to see much capture uh, at that agency. Uh, but no one had ever heard of MMS, uh, really, anyone in this room, I bet, uh, until the oil spill. And so that's, that's the situation. In 10 years, uh, hopefully we won't have another one of these conferences. But uh, it wouldn't surprise me, because it'll go back to relative obscurity. Uh, I'm not a big fan of splitting the enforcement arm from um, the uh, regulation writing arm, because I think the two inform each other. Um, and uh, one of the ways that the people who write the regulations, write good regulations, is talk to the people in the field, not only industry, but their own inspectors. Um, and if that makes that more difficult because of coordination problems, that's probably not a move in the right direction. Well, thank you both. And uh, Stephen DuPont. 
morning. My name is Steve DuPont. I'm an attorney with the Coast Guard. And uh, I'm going to focus now on the response to the oil spill. Um, I'm not going to talk at all about what led to the explosion and the sinking uh, for two reasons. One, uh, several investigations are still ongoing, so I really can't comment too much on that. Um, and the second reason is, uh, with 15 minutes to speak, I really need to focus on one area. And so since the Coast Guard's main role was response to the oil spill, that's what I'll be talking about. Um, just a quick timeline here. Um, you've all, you're all familiar with the facts and, and probably the timeline, but I just want to point out, between the time the, the rig sank and oil started flowing into the Gulf and the time that the well was finally secured uh, was 87 days. And so the, the best estimate is somewhere between 4.4 and 5.5, uh, 4 million barrels. That comes out to about, if you look at 5 million barrels, is about 210 million gallons. Uh, and so just to put that in perspective, the Exxon Valdez spill of 1989, uh, this is looking like it's about 19 times the size of the Exxon Valdez. So, uh, some of the different strategies used to combat the oil. Um, dispersants, if we just look at dispersants as sort of a uh, detergent that breaks up the oil into smaller droplets. Uh, the goal being try to keep it from reaching the, the shore as much as possible. Um, in situ burns, uh, this is just what it says, you know, you're burning the oil on scene uh, where, where it lies. Uh, one thing about the burns, or a couple things about the burns, uh, some, somewhat surprising, they worked particularly well. We found that the burning was particularly effective, um, but somewhat controversial. We actually, Coast Guard got sued during the response uh, by four NGOs concerned about uh, sea turtles. And so we had to work with the NGOs uh, to, you know, we already had a process in place where we had best management practices and we were working with Fish and Wildlife to document and observe wildlife while we're conducting the burns. But there was concerns with the NGOs that uh, we were perhaps burning turtles. So they, they uh, sued us for restraining order. Ultimately, we were able to work with them uh, and get the, the suit dismissed or get them to drop the suit. And the main issue for the, for the NGOs was, well, you say you're not burning turtles, um, but can you show us? We want to observe the burns. Uh, we couldn't have them observe the burns for several reasons, uh, mainly just logistically. Uh, this is 50 miles out and a small window to actually conduct burns. Uh, so what we ended up agreeing to was we'd have the NOAA and the Fish and Wildlife Service observers uh, forward their notes to the NGOs within a reasonable amount of time so they could see what the issues were on scene. And ultimately, they were happy with that. The point being, um, particularly for the, the future lawyers in the room, uh, when you're advising an agency, um, there are going to be different concerns that are going to come to bear on the response from different perspectives. Um, and so if we can work with the NGOs um, to try to avoid issues, maybe we can avoid lawsuits that, although this lawsuit didn't disrupt the spill, it did, uh, it certainly took the, the attorney's attention away for a little while. Um, the next issue is boom. Boom, if you just look at boom as sort of a, a barrier that goes on the water to either keep the oil away from an area or if it's soft boom to absorb the oil. Um, boom was highly controversial during the response because there was really no consensus as to what areas truly needed to be protected and what areas would be protected in an ideal situation. And basically there wasn't enough boom to go everywhere. And I'll talk a little bit of, more about that, but um, there wasn't enough boom for everywhere um, that it could have been used and there wasn't a general consensus as to where it was most needed. Um, Skimming. I did want to talk about skimming a little bit while we're here. Skimming is just, uh, it's a mechanical removal of oil in the water. Think of like a big vacuum cleaner apparatus um, that removes water, uh, excuse me, removes an oily water mixture. The surprising thing about skimming is, at least in this response, is it did not work as well as anticipated. Um, perhaps because of the open ocean environment, uh, you know, these machines are rated for an expected daily recovery capacity and while they collected a lot of oil, they didn't collect as much as what was expected. And I think that's important when you look at the planning that uh, the former MMS had in place for a well blowout. They actually planned for a worst case discharge and had contracted out skimmers to be able to respond to recover a worst case discharge. But we re in reality, what happened was uh, while they had the rated machines to recover a worst case discharge, they just didn't perform up to what was expected in that environment. So I think the big takeaway there is uh, research and development of um, skimming equipment, especially in an open ocean environment, is an area um, of increased scrutiny and something we need to look at. Uh, just some statistics on the size of the response. Um, you know, more than 47,000 people uh, responded to this, this event. Uh, the point here is 
Uh, it was truly an unprecedented response, um, unlike anything we've seen before, and it, uh, it was a lot of coordination that went into it. <coughs> um, so with that said, I mean, there's definitely some areas uh, for improvement, some lessons learned from this response that we can move forward, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about more about that, but getting kind of into the law now. Um, the main removal authority, the main response authority is the Clean Water Act. Uh, Section 311 vests removal authority with the president, and it, it gives the president the authority to take whatever action is necessary to remove oil from the water. Uh, and this has been delegated to the EPA for the inland zone and for the, to the Coast Guard for the coastal zone. And so the Coast Guard served as the federal on-scene coordinator for the Deepwater Horizon because it occurred, the spill occurred in the coastal zone. The Oil Pollution Act of 1990, this was in response to Exxon Valdez. So this is significant litigation because it set up uh, a liability regime and an oil spill liability trust fund. The concern at the time being, well, if something like this were to happen again, we need to make sure we have the resources, financial resources available to take care of it. Um, so if you think Exxon Valdez in 1989, Open 90, which is a really a landmark piece of legislation in 1990, fast forward, uh, to the Deepwater Horizon 19 times the size of the Exxon Valdez. So I think it's safe to assume there's some legislation on the way. Um, national Contingency Plan. This is very important. This is, um, it's codified in regulation, Title 40. And this lays out how the federal, state, and local governments are going to respond to an oil spill or, or a release of hazardous material. And what I really want to focus on is this concept of the Area Contingency Plan. The National Contingency Plan requires that these localized plans be created at the area level. Um, and they, part of that is federal, state, and local agencies serve on these committees and they identify, among other things, environmentally sensitive areas, uh, economically significant areas, and kind of prioritize how, in the event of a pollution response, how this is going to unfold. Uh, what we found, in an area of improvement, perhaps a lesson learned, is the federal government and state governments were well represented at the area contingency committees. Um, not so much so at the local level. Uh, counties and parish presidents um, and, and their agencies and county and parish agencies were not necessarily represented at all of the area contingency meetings. And when we went back and we looked at the conflict that was taking place during the response as to where the boom should go, what's truly an environmentally sensitive area and what's not, a lot of the conflict revolved with uh, local officials and disagreements. And when we went back and we looked at meeting minutes going back to 10 years prior to Deepwater Horizon, we saw that um, the federal government agencies were represented, state agencies were very well represented, but it didn't filter down to the counties and parishes. And so I think an area moving forward would be um, further coordination and integration with the county and parishes as to amending and revising area contingency plans. And I think that'll do away with a lot of the boom uh, boom wars, I guess, as you can call them. Um, but it's an important issue. Uh, the point is uh, the time to kind of come to an agreement as to what really needs to be protected ideally is not during the response, it's during the contingency planning. And if uh, all the players aren't at the table, um, then there's going to be conflict. And so that's an area for improvement for sure. Um, HSPD 5, that uh, basically it designates the Secretary of Homeland Security as the principal federal official for uh, significant incident response, in this case, uh, oil pollution incident. So how does this all fit together? Well, the federal on-scene coordinator in the coastal zone is pre-designated. It's a Coast Guard captain in the port that's pre-designated. Uh, since 1990, there have been over 11,000 pollution responses where a federal on-scene coordinator took, took charge of the response and actually had to open the federal fund to respond to it. Uh, most of these pollution responses are relatively small. Uh, when I served down in Miami as a pollution responder, I, I responded to over a dozen of these myself. And it, they're usually small, uh, what does that mean? Battery or low. I'll just keep talking. So they're, they're, usually, they're usually fairly small. Um, never before had we had uh, a spill of this size uh, that had to be uh, responded to, for sure. So let's see if the click still works. So from a federal on-scene coordinator, no. Is counting as my time? Click OK and see what happens. It might let you go. Perfect. Okay. 
So the federal on coordinator serves in what's called a unified area command. And the unified area command is where all the federal, state, and local agency representatives come together. The concept here is truly a unified effort. Uh, and then there, for Deepwater Horizon, there were four kind of mini unified area commands, with what's called incident command posts. And they were set up geographically along the Gulf at different locations. Um, the blocks in red, these are, this is all part of the National Contingency Plan, where you have regional response teams and other agencies that support the Federal On-Scene Coordinator and the Unified Area Command. Um, and there's also a national response team. Uh, there's 16 federal agencies that uh, are represented on this national response team, and they bring uh, particular expertise and resources uh, in support of a federal on-scene coordinator. Um, and this is how the this is where the principal federal official fits in. Um, obviously, everything flowing from the president. What was unique about this response is it's the first time we designated a spill of national significance. Uh, this had never been done before. This was a, a relatively new concept. It was added to the National Contingency Plan, uh, again in 40 CFR if you want to look at it, Part 300. It was added to the National Contingency Plan in the late 1990s. And the concept of a spill of national significance is if, if it's a spill that's so large or so complex that it's going to span every area of the federal <coughs> government or many areas of the federal government, then you would create a, na or you would designate it a spill of national significance and you'd have a national incident commander. Um, and so for Deepwater Horizon, it was uh, Admiral Fat Allen. And the reason I put his picture up there is we've all probably seen him during the response and maybe <coughs> weren't quite aware of where he fit into the, the structure. So he was the National Incident Commander. All right, this slide, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking on this slide because I think this is another area um, of perhaps some conflict during the response. And it has to do with the difference between responding to an oil spill and the difference between responding to a hurricane or a national disaster. Uh, and this is important. Um, under the National Contingency Plan, what we just saw, you have a federal on-scene coordinator uh, as part of a unified area command. For Deepwater Horizon, there were incident command posts that were set up. Um, but really what's going on here is the federal government has command and control over the response, and states and uh, locals are supporting the federal effort. This is in sharp contrast, or it's actually the, the, the reverse or inverse of a natural disaster where the White House would declare a state of emergency or, or national or, uh, disaster declaration, and then funds become available for a state governor. And at that point, the state is in charge and the federal government is in a support role. So states are used to responding to incidents under the Stafford Act because they've had a lot of experience with it, um, with hurricanes and other natural disasters, and not so much so under the National Contingency Plan where they're not, they don't have command and control, but they're actually in a supporting role. And so that kind of leads to the question, well, why do we have these two separate processes? Why don't we have one or the other? And what makes an oil spill different? And what makes an oil spill different is the concept of a responsible party. You know, the law requires that when oil gets in the water, someone's responsible for that. It's not like a hurricane where it's a you know, an act of God or natural disaster. Someone's responsible for oil being in the, in the water. And so the federal on-scene coordinator's job is to respond to that spill but the responsible party is actually responsible to clean it up. So the federal government is going to direct the efforts of the responsible party, and they're on the hook to clean it up and to pay for it. The federal on coordinator will federalize the spill if the responsible party is unable or unwilling to do what's needed to clean it up. So we saw a lot of this more so early on in the response in the media with, well, why doesn't the government just federalize the spill and take charge? I think it was a little misunderstanding. The government was always in charge. It's just by law, the responsible party is on the hook and they have to do what they're told to do to clean it up. And only if they're not doing that does the federal government step in, take charge of the response, open the all this bill liability trust fund. Um, and so the fund is also available to compensate fo uh, individuals for oil removal costs and damages. Uh, but the main concept here is that the polluter pays and only if they're unable or unwilling will the spill be federalized. Um, and so that's, that's all I have on that. Now, m moving forward, um, some other lessons learned or some things that, some concepts, some ideas. Moving forward, uh, three things, three big takeaways, I think, were um, area contingency plans, as I mentioned, uh, need to co coordinate more with the locals, uh, incorporating some more exercises to where we can come to more of an agreement as to what the environmentally sensitive areas are. 
Um, environmentally sensitive areas don't only need to be identified but prioritized. That's another big issue. Some of the plans identified ESAs, but they didn't necessarily prioritize them, and so that led to more uh, areas for discussion and, and, and conflict. Um, and finally, and this is perhaps really important, area contingency plans plan for worst case discharges from facilities, shoreside facilities, and vessels, but not necessarily for an offshore facility. Now, with that said, the MMS plans, the BOEMER plans, did plan for worst case discharges from offshore facilities, but as I said earlier, um, those plans relied heavily on mechanical removal, and as we saw during the response, the mechanical removal didn't necessarily work uh, in that environment as expected. Um, some legislative issues moving forward. I'm not lobbying for legislation. I'm just commenting on some things that perhaps are worthy of further consideration. That's all I'm doing here. Uh, research and development. This is fairly controversial, the concept of uh, open water testing. Uh, you know, the idea that you need to put oil in the water to conduct R&D, very controversial, um, and obviously you know, for obvious reasons. Um, but the time to find out that um, oil skimmers are not collecting as advertised in an open ocean environment is probably not during a response. Um, and so that may be some discussion on whether uh, the, the, the pros and cons and benefits of putting oil in the water um, to actually test how these machines and these devices work. Uh, I'm not a scientist, but I have spoken to some and they tell me that it's a lot different in a controlled environment than in an uncontrolled environment. Um, another area of uh, perhaps further discussion is the concept of these oil spill removal organizations that are contracted to provide these services, um, you know, certifying these organizations. Uh, and in order to do that, they'll, they'll require some legislation. There was gonna be some legislative authority necessary to certify OSROs. Um, and finally, although it wasn't an issue during this response, it definitely pointed out some areas of potential concern, is how we use this oil spill liability trust fund um, there are certain caps on the fund. Uh, there's an emergency fund for $50 million, and then Congress can uh, approve of additional appropriations up to $100 million at a time, not to exceed $1 billion per year. Um, put that in perspective, at the federal government, last time I checked, and this has already probably gone up, uh, the federal government had already spent from the fund uh, 800 and some odd million dollars, of which BP is uh, being billed for most, uh, for all of that. Um, but the point is, during this response, we had a responsible party um, that had resources available. Um, but if this had been a less resource uh, accessible company, perhaps an upstart or something like that, that would have put additional strains on the trust fund um, that it may not have been able or it would not have been able to handle. So that's just something to consider as well. That's all I have. While we're, while we're getting Dave set up, um, quick question, which is on pronunciation. We've, we have Bomer, we have Bomre, and we have Boemer. What is it? I, I, I say Boemer, but I have nothing to point to to say that that's correct. I don't know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and, uh, I, I say, I mean, the R comes before the E, so it doesn't, in, in my opinion, it doesn't make sense to say Bomer, although I think people say that because it's easy. So we say Bomer, but, you know, again. I, I say tomato. Exactly. <laughs> and it's all going to change. I mean, the whole point is here, we, here we're trying to pronounce this acronym, and it's going to change into three other acronyms, so it doesn't that's even matter. It's going to cease to exist. So. I think that's the, that's the the employer themselves calling themselves They don't like it. They don't like it. And, and, and they just couldn't see themselves calling themselves So it, it doesn't lend itself very easily. And originally it was going to be something like, when the initial acronym was being considered, it was something like boom. And then they, and then they, they for <laughs> obvious reasons, decided boom was not a good acronym for overseeing safety in the. <laughs> okay. Good morning, and again, I'm Dave Westerholm, and, and I'm probably going to take a, uh, a little bit different tack. Uh, I, I don't think you'll hear anything different in, in my, um, my presentation than the, my colleagues that, that preceded me. I think you might, I think I, I might twist it in a little bit different way because my particular office is full of scientists as opposed to, as opposed to lawyers, although we work very closely with them on the natural resource damage assessment. And, and, uh, 
and I was asked before I came to this conference if I really wanted to bring science and facts to a room full of lawyers, but, <laughs> dis <laughs> but, despite, but despite that, I said absolutely. So it, we were asked the question, what's the single most important uh, factor that contributed to the, the magnitude of the event? And, and like Steve, there's some things that probably I would speak to on you know, uh, failure regulation and other things, but with the ongoing investigation, both with um, the cause of the accident, the Department of Justice potential criminal investigation, and the uh, natural resource damage assessment, which falls under my office, which is still ongoing, that part of it and, and the cause and, and ultimately what will be determined either through um, some sort of consensus or in a court of law will, will really come out. But, but there have been a lot of interesting um, discussions preceding that. But like Steve, I'll talk a little bit more about the response side. And, and I think that the, the, the largest factor in that that really falls into two, um, two categories, one being uh, the technical piece, the technical challenges. Uh, I won't delve into that too much, but someone explained to me, and I haven't done the calculation yet, but, but working down a mile deep in that drilling environment um, you know, with, with a four-story tall blowout preventer, it would be like one of us with the, the pressures down there with one of us standing and having the uh, Washington Monument put on our chest. So, so you can see the technical challenges are, are not unlike sending a man to a moon or something else. And over the years, the, um, the oil industry uh, and the regulatory industry has looked at that and developed ways to to extract those resources in balancing what, what we'll talk a little bit about as the environmental risk versus uh, the need for oil, energy independence, and, and our nation's, you know, um, our nation's uh, not unfettered need, but continuing demand for petroleum products. Uh, you know, on the other side, though, I think I would like to, to as we go through the presentation, really say that, that the magnitude event also boiled down to a matter of trust and communication. And what we'll see as I present this, and many of you will think back to as we experienced it, some of the information that was coming out, um, both from the responsible party, you know, from the government, from uh, states, NGOs, everyone, not all of it was perceived the same way by the general public or the media. And the ability to communicate and discuss that really became a, a huge issue during the spill. So with that, I think, do I click or hit the, hey, I got that. Okay, so I, what I'm gonna do, there we go. Um, what I'm gonna do is just break it down real quickly so we'll have time for questions into, you know, what, what, was, the, what was our role in NOAA, uh, the mandates and key areas of support, what were some of the challenges, public concerns, and, and what, what do we think of as we look past the horizon? So there's the event again. Um, okay, so I'm, it's kind of, set up. all right, there we go. So, so there are five areas that we focused on, and, and I'll go through these in a little more detail, but we provided scientific support to the federal on-scene coordinator uh, through, um, through my office with, the, with that, and, but that is more than just the science of oil spills. You'll see how to keep seafood safe, protecting the wildlife and the habitats, ultimately assessing the damage that occurred that is ongoing and will continue to be ongoing, and ultimately any uh, money collected from that damage assessment to be put back into restoring the environment all under uh, the Oil Pollution Act, um, which was explained earlier. So for scientific support, there's a, there's a number of areas, and I'll, I'll briefly go through them. We did uh, twice, da we started daily and twice daily trajectory forecast. Where's the oil going? What to, to anticipate so that they could make key response decisions as to where to deploy equipment. Um, weather forecasting. We did more uh, spot weather forecast for this event than we've ever done in the history of NOAA. There were like 400 spot weather forecasts. And in fact, the Gulf of Mexico was, is so large that we were doing weather forecasts for different locations so that, that again, we could make the right decisions on uh, the type of equipment, where to put it, uh, approaching storms. There were a few lightning strikes uh, that, ha that happened and, and an injury associated with one. So, so this was a real, this was a real, um, big factor in the response. We have a, uh, a wealth of information on both atmospheric and oceanographic, but it, it's really critical. There's a number of mechanisms that were used in this bill, all the way from satellites to ships to unmanned uh, aircraft to um, 
underwater unmanned aircraft gliders and, and Navy UAVs. And uh, we provided, we, we talked about earlier the different types of response mechanisms in situ burning. You saw that there were 400 uh, in situ burns prior to this event. Um, you probably could count on one hand, I, I'm sure there were less than 10 worldwide of where this had been done successful. For this event, there were 400. Aerial dispersants uh, is the plane, the second one, and then the mechanical cleanup with the, with the skimmers. There were obviously many different types of skimmers employed in this event. Seafood safety. Um, to our, to my knowledge, and I, I, no one has uh, found an example of this, this was the very first time that a federal fishery was closed for an oil spill. State fisheries have been closed before for oil spills. Federal fisheries have been closed to manage the fishery in the past, but never because of an oil spill. But because of the type of spill this was, it was an ongoing event, couldn't stop the leak. Um, that whole area, large area of the Gulf of Mexico, 30 some percent of the federal, 33 percent of the federal fisheries area was close to fishing. And it was, it's, from an administrative and a legal point of view, it's a, it, it is not easy, but a lot easier to close one than to reopen one with all the, with all the samples and everything that had to be taken. But it was incredibly important. Um, one of the, um, one of the issues, and, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, was the perception that people had about seafood. And yet, what, what I'll come back to the conclusion is nowhere in this event did any um, tainted seafood ever reach, reach the marketplace. And, and part of it was the uh, restrictions that had been put in place. Protecting wildlife and habitats. Um, the, the, down, the, uh, the map down below is very difficult to see. You'll get a copy of it, may, may help a little bit. Uh, you can also go online and, and look at it, but it, it just showed all the uh, dolphin and uh, um, sea turtle strandings and collection points, but uh, obviously the dots are bigger than, than reality, but you, you, it was throughout the whole area of the spill, um, which included hundreds of uh, sea turtles and hundreds of submarine mammals. So now we had to assess the, the uh, damage, and I, uh, I use this picture because it kind of shows different ways. There's some marshland that's oiled. Um, you know, what's the, best re what's the best technique for responding to that? Do you leave it alone? Do you cut it out? Do you try to, to wash it off? How, how do you get it in there? Is it, you're gonna have re-oiling. You, you have the shoreline on the, the right side, and although this isn't a great picture, much of the beaches in that whole area are also tourist areas, and a tremendous impact to the tourist industry, and they don't want any oil on their beaches. And I show the underwater leak because there is damage that occurred as the plume went up through the water column. You know, how to assess that, how do you, how do you determine what impact that had to the ecosystem down there, both to the benthic community and the deep sea, whether it would be deep sea corals or others, or uh, migratory fish through that area, yellowfin, bluefin, tuna, things like that. And then ultimately we're going to, you know, restore, but you, could, you, you see a, a number of different ecosystems throughout the Gulf of Mexico region and, and uh, you know, much like we do in other parts of the United States, but, but um, th this part of the country is also uh, very fragile in some cases because of the storm impact and other that, that we're already getting some erosion and it's critical that we keep um, some vegetation to, to help protect the, the inland areas. All right, so what were some of the challenges in public concern? You know, things, that they, things that were either miscommunicated or talked about, the flow rate how that flow rate changed from a small number to a large number. What was right, what was wrong, who, who did what. You know, I'll be happy to address questions later on it, but, but it was really a confusing fact. How about using subsea dispersants? Up until this time, there had been one other example and then mostly just papers for, written on it for theory, but never practice. And in this case, you know, they put an injection wand a mile deep, put it into the um, <coughs> escaping, oil plume and disperse the oil before it ever came to the surface. Effective, but what, what, what were the environmental problems and risk? And, and I'll tell you, in, in many blogs and other areas, it was a, you, you saw a, a perception that this, by adding that dispersant, it was going to be, um, you know, very scary and we were going to be creating a uh, health risk to the entire population. 
What was the effect of the oil rising up from the bottom? Um, again, a mile rise, you know, you, you have a leak from a vessel or, or a shallow well, your pool of oil is spread over a, a number of yards, maybe the size of a football field, maybe even a little bit bigger. Here we were talking miles as the oil came up when it, when it eventually surfaced. And um, studies on what were the potential biological impacts down below. Some of the surface issues were what happened to the oil on the surface, how was it going to move by wind and current, and, and you might have heard about the loop current. The loop current, uh, I, don't have, I don't have a pointer, but, but I'll kind of walk over. If you see the, the bottom red line coming up from, from Cuba and South America, typically that goes all the way up until the spill site, then loops around and goes down through the straits of Florida. Do we have a pointer? Oh, that'd be great. Try that red button. There we go. So it normally would come all the way up here. But we, we were fortunate in that an eddy broke out, broke up and, and did a uh, circulating pattern here and a, and a counter circulating pattern there. So that the oil that was entrained, at least from some satellite imagery and detected, maybe a small amount actually got into this and, and rotate around. Most of it were, was in that counter current. Previous years, that loop current has come up as far as where the wellhead site was. And you can imagine with that current being underwater, pulling all that oil out and, and moving it this way, the threat then increased to the state of Florida, uh, the Straits, Tarballs on the East Coast, and, and much of the East Coast. And then there was, again, speculation in the, in the papers that that may go for, as far away as Europe or up in, into the New England states. Uh, we had to address a lot of those questions. Uh, ultimately, again, there was, there was um, controversy and, and confusion. Two other um, areas and, or challenges were the approach of a storm. This area had not, but a few years before, suffered many storms and a year before that, Hurricane Katrina. Um, a real big issue. We had to pull resources off the water with the threat of a hurricane that came that summer. And then, and then also, um, what was the, you know, all the different methods were used, but what were the environmental impacts and what were the best um, and concerns with the, the choices made for surface removal of oil. And then I mentioned a little bit about shoreline and some of the protection strategies, shoreline cleanup assessment technique that is used for the, the SCAT teams to determine where to go and then and the different types of shoreline cleanup. Now what are some of the issues looking forward? You've heard of some of these already, some are being talked about. Um, how do we get better planned and prepared for um, offshore exploration and production. It's certainly not going to be just the uh, reorganization of, of MMS into uh, BOMER and, and a, a regulatory arm. There's going to have to be some further discussion of, of how to not only regulate and, and develop that area, but what did we learn from sort of this worst case scenario. Uh, containment and underwater countermeasures. Eventually they built the containment dome that went over the wellhead and captured the majority of the oil until they could drill a uh, intercept well and actually um, kill the well itself. That technology really was developed on the fly. Uh, amazing that they could get it done, what probably would normally have taken years and in, in, in days and months, but as you might recall, the first attempts at some of that failed. There, you know, the, the containment of methane hydrates and others in, in the, the first containment system. Ultimately, uh, the oil companies have come together and said that they're going to have a, um, a company that is going to be able to, to do this. I, uh, I will also tell you that um, not a lot of, I won't say a lot of thought, but not a lot of people felt that this was necessary. Uh, I've had you know, a fair amount of experience in, and, it, and when I was in the Coast Guard station down in the Gulf and had dealt with some well blowouts here, and I, I probably would have been one of those who would said that the blowout preventer would work. They usually do, it's worked in the past. This is not something that they wouldn't have expected. And even when the beginning, when it happened, the shear rams that, that apparently had triggered but didn't do what they were supposed to do because of a, uh, a piping, Normally, they thought that if they get down there with a remotely operated vehicle, they could, they could close off the shear rams and that would be the end of the story. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't that. So I think the whole idea of how they're going to do this underwater containment, especially in deep wells, especially in other areas. Uh, you know, one of the other productive fields that 
the United States has access to is off the Arctic. It presents its own unique challenges, but certainly something that has to be considered here. And then how do we do better modeling? One of the things that my office does really well is surface modeling where the oil goes. Not so much three-dimensional, so we're going to be working on that. And then um, seafood safety. I, I said I'd come back to this, but there was a tremendous impact in seafood safety in the markets of here in New England and Virginia, people not buying seafood. In some cases, they, weren't, they were not buying halibut because of the potential for oil tainting. And, you know, halibut's coming in from Alaska, not the Gulf of Mexico. <laughs> but, but, but rationality didn't play out here. It was, it was, a, it was a fear. And, and you know, I, I've used this example before, too, but if you saw some of the advertisement coming out that time, like I think it was Long John Silver's and a couple other companies, said Pacific shrimp. You know, now, actually, some of their shrimp probably, I think, comes from Indonesia, which is still over in the Pacific, but, <laughs> but, but the whole concept is that there's still something wrong with the seafood in the Gulf of Mexico, and there never was. The, the shrimping industry, the oysters, the areas that were closed weren't used, the areas that were open, none of that seafood that went to market was tainted, but that didn't stop people from making conscious decisions the other way. Um, the fisheries and wildlife closures, I think I talked about that. Research and development was covered uh, earlier. I think it's a key point of we need to make an investment. There was a lot of investment ever after Exxon Valdez. Not so much in the intervening years. It's one of those areas that um, is within the federal budget when things are tight, take some cuts. And so not having a lot of money poured in from either side, even, even industry had cut back the amount of their research and development. So we were using some of the same or, or much of the same technology that had been available for 20 years. And then, and then my uh, last point here is social media. And, and we, this one really bears a lot of a lot more discussion, more time than we have today. But we were faced with um, a different event. You know, I, I, from 30 years of cleanup oil spills, I'd, I had seen it from, you know, written reports that went out to the nightly news to maybe about 10 years ago, it was the CNN world. You know, people would show up and they'd want real-time pictures and information. But we're in a new world now. This is, everybody wants that same information instantly on their iPhone or iPad or in a Twitter or, or Flickr account. And, and I, don't, I don't think we, we're, we were aware but not prepared. And I think it really is something we have to think forward. How much, how much responsibility does industry and or the government have for providing that instant information to the American public on an event such as this? Um, we, we could debate that. The desire is still going to be there. The, the picture I have down in the right-hand corner is the geo platform. We, we had a common operating picture system that, that we had developed that was used for response to make decisions called IRMA. Uh, it worked well. Uh, Admiral Allen picked it to be the sort of common operating picture for this event. It was easily briefed. It did it for White House. CNN took some expert uh, excerpts on it. But there was a desire to be able to put this in the hands of the public, and so on the fly we converted what um, the majority of that information into uh, geo platform and and added, you know, for Irma we had added 5,000 data layers, just that, which means different sources of information coming into this, and you could click and you, and describe what picture. So if you wanted real time where the ships were going or where the dispersants were or aerial pla patterns where the wildlife was captured, you could go on here and pick and choose what you wanted to see, and you could do it in much like a Google Earth format. Um, when it came online that afternoon, within a matter of hours, we had three million hits. Um, but again, I, I would argue is, is that the role of the government in this role, case to provide that information, or is it the role of, of industry? No, and I, and I don't know that we can escape it, because if you don't do that, um, that void will be filled some, some other way. And, we, and it really, if there was a turning tide and everything I had said earlier about some of this information, when this came out and people were able to see it and visualize it, it did diminish the amount of questions and concerns that, that previous to this had, had been, you know, um, really on the rise. And with that, I am, I'm done, so. We can, <laughs> we can wait for questions until after, the sh after all the presentations. Thank you.
Next, we're going to, and finally, we're going to hear from Garrett Graves, um, who, again, is the director of the Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority in Louisiana, and I believe he's going, and I believe he's going to talk to us about some of the local impacts and, and drilling in the Gulf moving forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to be here. Um, I was reminded on the importance of, uh, of preparation as I parked in a, a parking spot, probably about as far away from this uh, building as I possibly could have and um, didn't have an umbrella. Um, and so uh, interesting that we're talking about that today. So I'm going to go over three things here. I'm going to go over uh, kind of a crash course on coastal Louisiana. I'm going to go over the effects of the oil spill, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about why I was actually asked to be here, which is um, talking about lessons learned a bit. Um, so here's a satellite depiction of uh, North America. And uh, Dave, we actually stole this from, from you guys. This is a NOAA um, uh, depiction here. And this is what it looked like 60 million years ago. And, and, and what I want to commend your attention to is right about there, which is the uh, perhaps present day Missouri. That's the, the base of the Mississippi River 60 million years ago. And watch what happens over about a 5 million year uh, increments here. You can see how the Mississippi River actually built uh, much of that area, much of the, the, the states coming down from Missouri south, and um, lit literally built the entire state of Louisiana. Um, uh, so this is a, we, we, we live on a deltaic plain in, in south Louisiana. Our, our state was, was, was uh, literally a product of the river. Uh, zooming in on Louisiana, you can see New Orleans there. Uh, these are the various tracks that the river took over about a 5,000 year period. These different lobes of land that, that, that built deltas. They were, again, deltaic plains. And, and the river would change course about every 12 to 1,500 years. Um, zooming in on the New Orleans area, the little dot there you can see is New Orleans. 4,300 years ago, it was actually underwater. Um, and you can see over a 1,300 year period how this delta came out here. You can see how the delta further west came out. Um, about a thousand years later, you can see changes over on the eastern side, and then how this Mississippi River Delta, the, the Plaquemines Delta, came out um, a thousand years after that. So, so our state was actually growing almost one square mile per year as a result of the river. We were actually creating land. Um, then in 1927, we had this huge flood of the Mississippi River. Um, pretty extraordinary event, largest riverine flood in our nation's history. Congress came in and said, you know what, we're going we're gonna to build levees on the river. We're going to stop that from ever happening again. One of the most successful public works projects in our nation's history from two perspectives. Number one is we have not had another riverine flood um, on the Mississippi River in this area. Um, very, very successful. Number two, I showed that slide a minute ago uh, showing how the river changed course. And um, uh, being a maritime state, it makes it very difficult if the river's not where your chart show it's going to be. So if the river's changing course and you're trying to, trying to navigate up this river and it's not there, then that's a problem. So these levees keep the river right there between the banks. You no longer have this delta switching or the, the river actually changing course. So again, very successful. Navigation perspective, we now have the top navigation industry in the country, five of the top 15 ports in the nation, 19% of waterborne commerce, all come from, from our state. 31 states in the United States depend upon our river system for maritime commerce. Very successful. On the flip side, looking at the environmental impacts. When you severed that relationship between the Mississippi River and the adjacent wetlands, you severed that sustainable ecosystem. We have lost 2,300 square miles of coastal wetlands in, um, in, in coastal Louisiana since the 1930s, since these levees were installed. You want to talk about regulatory capture. Let's talk about regulatory capture for a minute. This, this was carried out by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the, these levees that were built on our, on our Chafalaya River, on the Mississippi River. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has delegated authority under the Clean Water Act to regulate wetlands. They have destroyed 2,300 square miles of wetlands. You or I, if we impact a tenth of an acre, we have to file for a permit and we have to take, carry out mitigative actions. They have done absolutely nothing. 2,300 square miles, the largest destruction of wetlands in our nation's history by far, and we supposedly have a no net loss of wetlands policy, and this is done by the agency that regulates wetlands. You want to talk about regulatory capture. Let's zoom in and see what that looks like. This is an area southwest of, uh, of New Orleans. This is uh, an area called Terrebonne Parish. Um, and this, is, this looks like perhaps fish habitat or wetlands or where people don't live. And these are actually communities. Cocodry, Dulac, Chauvet, Montague. Thousands of people live here, believe it or not. And I want you to focus on the fact that this is a 17-year period. I'm going to show the impacts. Over 17 years, that's what happens in terms of the loss of wetlands. 
We've lost since the 1930s an average of about 28 square miles per year. Over the last five to six years, we've lost in the range of 70 to 80 square miles of land per year. All jurisdictional wetlands. Uh, Government Accountability Office indicated that up to 90% of the coastal wetlands lost in the nation is attributable, excuse me, in the continental United States is attributable losses in coastal Louisiana. Effects of Hurricanes Katrina and Rita in 2005. Uh, just just um, uh, taking a look on here, I know that a that, uh, little bit difficult to see perhaps from where, where some of you guys are sitting, um, but if you want to look at the, the third one from the bottom, the Breton Sound, these are the different basins. And, and what this shows is the yellow or white uh, line there shows that, um, that, that we lost, and I'm going to take a wag and say 80 square miles um, between 1956 and 2004 in that basin. And then just from Hurricanes Katrina and Rita, we lost, uh, I don't know, maybe 45 square miles. So, so in effect, over two days, we lost the same, or excuse me, half the land that was lost um, over a 50-year over a period. In two days. Just giving you an idea of the fragility of this area. So then, let's add some oil to that. So this is what the wetlands look like. These were pictures that we took um, after going out on the, on the coast. Um, for about 100 days um, during the height of this thing. Uh, this oil was incredible. It was, this was actually standing up about an inch and a half uh, off the beach there. Um, that was a seagull that I walked past about 20 times before I realized it was actually something. Um, uh, you could see the submerged oil, and, and, and you know, a lot of folks uh, uh, allege that the dispersants changed the, the, the characteristics of the oil and caused this, this um, uh, submergent or, or, or um, I guess adjusted the characteristics to where it didn't, wasn't quite as buoyant or, or, or um, uh, stay on top of the water as, as we normally would expect. And so adding to the challenge in Louisiana, uh, why did I talk about the coast and the degradation at the beginning? Here's why. Looking at coastal Mississippi, you have a, a relatively straight uniform line there. You have the uh, Bay St. Louis where, um, where, where you have the opening, but this is what coastal Louisiana looks like. Okay, and I'll talk about what this is important in a minute. But look at all these fragmented, jagged edges. Look at all these nooks and crannies, all these pockets. This is what coastal Alabama looks like. Once again, uh, barrier islands rather straight across, pretty united beach area that runs parallel to the Gulf. Um, this is coastal Louisiana, a bit further over to, um, to the west in, in Barataria Bay. Um, here's coastal Florida, and this is the Panhandle area, Pensacola, uh, Navarra uh, beach areas. Um, but, but again, um, they have a, a straight barrier island uh, beach there. And, and here's coastal Louisiana in um, Timbalier, Terrebonne Bay area further west than the previous two pictures. And so if you're trying to stop oil there or here, fundamentally different situation. And this, again, I'm not sure if you guys can see this or not, but this shows if you measure the, the, the coastline of Louisiana smoothly from uh, Texas to Mississippi, you get about 400 miles. If you actually go back and you follow the tidal shoreline of our state, it's almost 7,800 miles. Okay, 7,800 miles. And you can see the, the, the ratio of coastline versus shoreline b blows away any other state. The total shoreline miles blows away any other state. And even Florida, because Florida obviously includes the, the, the lower portion of the state in the, in the eastern coast, which was not affected or threatened by the oil spill. So this is what, uh, again, what we were faced with. Dolphins swimming through slicks, oyster uh, reefs oiled, uh, sea turtles oiled, um, just, just complete coverage of oil um, for miles. Um, it, it, was, it, was, it was really just, just incredible. Oops, sorry, I didn't realize I had those in. Um, th this area here, I, I, just saw this over and over again, this heavy black oil. I mean, just completely void of life. It, it, whether it was a, a microorganism, a plant, a, a, some type of marine mold life, done. Um, and and uh, the place was just covered um, in oil. And this shows the Mississippi River coming down. This shows where the oil was coming in. This the satellite uh, depiction from NASA um, showing just the, just the complete coverage of the Gulf and the high concentrations of heavy and moderately oil, uh, oiled uh, concentrations. And, off Louisiana's coast there. Um, so what was at risk? What does this mean? You have oil there, you have a degrading coast um, in terms of uh, uh, coastal erosion. What does it mean? Well, what it means is you have hundreds of thousands of Louisianians that, that's lives and livelihoods are at risk. Um, you have a very unique culture, the Cajun culture that was actually chased out of uh, 
Nova Scotia. Some landed up, uh, up above us in Maine, and, and the rest came down to Louisiana. And, and, and that's threatened because of the, the, the disbursement that's caused by the loss of livelihoods. We have the best food and restaurants in the nation that, that's based upon our seafood in South Louisiana. The crabs, the, the, the redfish, the speckled trout, the snapper, all, all that is threatened. U.S. Fish calls South Louisiana the most productive ecosystem in North America. Um, we bring in more oysters, shrimp, finfish, crabs, and, and other species than anywhere else in the nation. So, so what's at risk? All these things are at risk. On the recreational side, we're the fourth top recreational fishing destination in the nation. It's easy there. People think they're good fishermen. It's just easy. It's a productive ecosystem. <laughs> but, but, but keep in mind, it's not just about, you know, I didn't get to go fishing, which was frustrating. It's also the repercussions. You have communities that were set up to support that industry. The bait shops, the hotels, the restaurants. They're done. Um, we were working to try to reverse the, the, the ecosystem destruction caused by Hurricanes Katrina and Rita in 2005, caused by Hurricanes Gustav and Ike in 2008. Um, we lost 217 square miles of land in 2005, just from those hurricanes. 2008, we had, again, exacerbated loss. And, and we were making progress. Believe it or not, in 2010, we were on track to have the lowest rate of land loss since the 1930s. And this oil spill destroyed it. Contaminated sediments, contaminated project areas, pulling project managers off of, of restoration projects and putting them on oil spill. Um, freezing funds, uh, 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 redirecting funds to other types of response efforts. Um, so, so again, the, 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 the risk, the impact's extraordinary. Um, you guys, I, I kind of went over this. I'm going to point out the bottom one here for just a minute. Ninety percent of the species in the entire Gulf of Mexico are dependent upon the unique coastal estuary that's supported by the, the, the confluence of the Mississippi River and the, uh, and the Gulf of Mexico. Ninety-eight percent of commercial um, uh, commercially harvested uh, fish and shellfish in the, in the Gulf of Mexico are dependent upon the unique coastal estuary that Louisiana's wetlands provide. And so what's at risk? You have, the, you have all this, this oil in this area, and it's the most productive area. Looking at the birds here, I mean, it, just extraordinary statistics. Extraordinary. Um, so here's what happens, and, and, and I heard that, um, uh, I believe Dave went over this a little bit, but you know, here's some of the options when you have oil in your wetlands, like in this photo. You burn the wetlands, you leave the oil in place and let the, the, the natural bioremediation process take place for years in a situation like this. Um, the National Incident Commander, Admiral Allen, recognized that if you had a choice between oiling a beach and oiling a wetland, you would always choose a beach. You, you scrape the sand, you, you throw it out, and, and um, you can bring your sand in if you need. So, so here's what we're dealing with, and I'm going to say it for the 12th time. The most productive ecosystem in North America is hit with 92% of the heavily and moderately old shorelines. Uh, the most productive ecosystem in North America um, had 80% of the heavily moderately old shorelines at any given time during the spill. Over half of, uh, of all the shorelines that were oiled in the Gulf were there. Um, about 60% of all mammals and birds that were collected during the spill were collected in our offshore waters. Um, so here's what I was actually asked to address. So I kind of went through all the things that I wanted to talk about, and, and then you guys get two slides, or maybe three, I don't remember. But, and there's a bunch of words, so I'm going to try and explain it. So revisiting OPA. What, what are some of the things here, and, and I know that, that uh, Coast Guard um, didn't lobby and just shared, I don't know, uh, perspective on, on, on some of his thoughts on here. And, and there are a few things. The, the first thing is, is that you really need to, 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 to fundamentally revisit the issue of the, and I'm sorry for all the acronyms, I was trying to keep them on one line, and so I'll go through those. RPs, responsible parties. You've really got to reevaluate the role of the responsible parties um, in, in these oil spill responses. These guys, I heard the Coast Guard say it over and over and over again, that the Coast Guard has 51% control. Um, the Coast Guard did an absolutely phenomenal job and saved thousands of lives and helped our state recover uh, much faster than they ever would have during Hurricane Katrina. Um, just, just absolutely heroes. Um, Admiral Allen was a hero in Hurricane Katrina. Um, I, saw, I saw him much more constrained in this, in this disaster, and I don't want to um, uh, speculate as to what was going on, but, but, but I saw him much more constrained. Um, you can, and, I, and I have this on another slide, but I really want to highlight this. You can't overstate the conflict of interest that occurs when the responsible party is cutting the checks. Okay, so uh, I, I believe the Coast Guard uh, went over this a little while ago, but there is a billion dollar cap per incident. So far, the spill has, has almost exceeded $15 billion. So what would have happened if BP didn't stay at the table? 
The oil spill liability trust fund's balance is, uh, is one or one point something billion, I believe, right now. What would have happened? Where, where, where do you, where do you, how do you fund these other response operations? 15 billion, 15 times the cap. So far, we're not anywhere close to, to being done. And, and not just that. So I, I, I'm very frustrated with the BP, but I'm also going to say that I commend them for staying at the table. And ARCO, MOAX, and, and um, Transocean, the other named responsible party so far, never came to the table. I haven't cut a single check. BP did, and, and I respect them for that, for staying at the table. Um, but the entire time throughout this bill, um, the federal government was doing this, or is doing this balancing act. If BP walks, we're going to have a disaster, a greater disaster, a greater catastrophe. And so you've, they've had to play this, this game with BP. And, 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 the, and the, the authority that BP has been able to exercise as a result of, of being able to control the checkbook is ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. And just to give you a quick example, a few weeks ago, we got a data management plan proposal um, from, from uh, um, the federal licensing coordinator and asking us to sign it. Start going through it and just see some extraordinary provisions. Things like BP is the only entity that receives the raw data from the spill. The only entity. They do the, uh, the uh, quality assurance, quality control, and then make it available to us. I mean, that's absurd. <laughs> do you not think this is going to go into billions of dollars in litigation? Of course, they wrote the plan. And, 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 and over and over again, I, I was talking to a federal engineering coordinator one a few months back, and he had issued some order in response. And, and the order just, <clears throat> the order blindsided us. I said, could you please explain this? You know, why, why, did it blind, why did you guys blindside us with this? Why are you fundamentally changing response um, status right now whenever we still have oil all over our coast? Uh, you know, could you please explain to me the basis of this and how you expect us to move forward and, and, and get all these things reapproved? He turns to the Coast Guard and says, actually, I don't, I don't know. Um, they wrote it. Let me ask them. He signed it. I mean, that kind of control in a disaster like this is, is absolutely unacceptable. And, and, and that needs to be revisited. Um, so, so the per cap incident I talked about, um, improving the role of state and locals, and, and, and Commander did address that as well um, in the incident command structure. Um, you know, and, and he talked about Stafford Act and hurricanes, and um, you know, the bottom line is that, um, is, is that this all goes back to the, top, to the top issue. With the control that BP was able to exercise throughout and continues to exercise in this disaster, um, it, it, you've got to have more involvement. There's been a lot of frustration at the state and local level with BP, and, and until you change that, that, that command control structure um, and, and allow for more input from the locals that know these coastal areas so well, and, uh, and the state, um, it's going to continue to be a very frustrating experience in future spills. Um, requiring a down payment on natural resource injuries and the Clean Water Act fines. BP is potentially liable for $40 billion. It, some of the estimates with the natural resource damages with the oil, uh, with the, uh, oil discharge and the Clean Water Act. $40 billion. There's nothing that compels them to pay that until uh, there's scenarios where this could go on for 20 years. We could sit there with a degraded ecosystem, degraded natural resources for 20 years, while those fishermen and all those people that uh, depend upon the coast for subsistence, depend upon the resources for their, for their economic interest and for their livelihoods, remain just stagnant. For 20 years, uh, litigation, the, the NERDA process to, to measure these injuries normally takes 7 to 10 years in a normal spill if there's such a thing. This one's certainly extraordinary. Um, they need to have a down payment. We shouldn't be um, uh, uh, penalized by, by this process and by the irresponsibility that, that, that resulted, um, excuse me, that, that uh, yielded this bill. Um, Prepositioning response resources, things like boom, skimmers, um, other things, uh, to having those in the Gulf to where we're not ordering them from Europe and waiting for them to come. Um, the boom was a, was a major challenge, and, and the Coast Guard refers to it as boom wars, and, and they're right. Uh, boom was a critical resource. Um, the dedication of, of research and development funding, and the Coast Guard does have, from the Oil Spill Liability Trust Fund, they're supposed to have a dedicated fund for research and, and development, and that, uh, that, that funding has not been consistent or at the levels that I think Congress intended back in OPA 90. Um, streamlining technology dispersant remediation approvals, um, I'll bet that I received, uh, I don't know, I'll just take a guess and say 10,000 ideas on how we could stop the spill, how we could capture the oil, and many other things. Um, uh, from, from praying to, um, uh, to people scuba diving down to the well, a mile deep, however that works. And, uh, 
you, you, you've got to have a process whereby you can actually funnel and evaluate these things and prioritize them. Um, you know, some of, some of those innovative things, the folks drove porta potty vacuum trucks on barges and went and sucked up oil. It worked. It was great. We had a, we had a void there, and it worked. Um, you know, the skimmers didn't perform in some cases as, as anticipated, and so it worked. And then the last thing I have on there is um, catastrophic disaster. You know, perhaps you need to look at a situation like this, and in the nuclear industry, the federal government has something established called Price-Anderson. It's a catastrophic um, sort of insurance fund um, that, that, that is, um, uh, again, a partnership between government and, and agencies. And, and I think in a situation like this, with the risk that are associated with, um, with deep water production, it's something that, that should be considered. Future of offshore energy, which is one of the other things I was asked to do, and, and I know I'm over time. I'm going to try and go very quick. Um, so uh, fundamental difference. You guys live up in the Northeast, and you don't produce energy here. And, and I get that. And you don't like the way oil smells or tastes, and don't like the way it looks, and I get that too. But the reality is that all of you guys drove here. I flew here yesterday. And, and the reality is that it's, that it's an important part of our economy. And I would love nothing more for us to be able to harness the energy of the sun and to be able to power everything that we do. But the reality is, is that fossil fuels are going to continue to play a role in our economy for decades. And, and, and we need to continue to invest money in alternatives to try to improve um, uh, their affordability and incorporation into our, into our economy. But um, we've produced hundreds of billions of barrels of oil in the Gulf of Mexico and trillions of cubic feet of natural gas. And we've produced them safely. And so what's happened right, uh, and, and, and let me, uh, the third bullet there. If, if we're not producing in the Gulf of Mexico, we're not producing domestically, where's it coming from? The demand doesn't decrease. We, we bring it in from other places. The United States, believe it or not, has the most, some of the most stringent, I'm not going to say the most, some of the most stringent environmental restrictions and regulations on, on, uh, on the environment and on energy production in the world. But what happens when we're not producing it here? We're importing it from phenomenal areas like Nigeria and Venezuela. Anybody check on Nigeria's regulatory status related to the environment and energy production? Just, just Google it and you'll be fascinated. It looks like the BP oil spill on a daily basis. Venezuela, yes, let's definitely pump hundreds of billions of dollars into the economy of Hugo Chavez so he can share American, val American values around the world. It doesn't make sense. Those are two of the top nations that we import oil from. So we need to continue to invest and focus on alternative energy streams, but we need to be realistic that fossil fuels are going to continue to play a role in our economy. And we've got to find ways to do it safely here in the United States where it can help our economy and, and we're not exporting uh, uh, hundreds of billions of dollars to these other places. Um, the Deepwater Horizon incident was an anomaly. You, you, you look at the reports, you look at what happened, and it's referring to the top two bullets and then look at what happened here. It was an anomaly and, it was, and, and, and I believe gross negligence um, and it was there. So I think this is my last slide. I'm just going to... Uh, examples of lessons learned. The first three bullets are all um, uh, pretty much quotes from, the, from BP's response plan for this, uh, for this well. Um, they, they indicated that they didn't expect an impact on walruses or seals. Well, there's a good reason, because those aren't in the Gulf. We looked and looked. Um, uh, the second thing is, is that they, they, they had this guy's name in there very prominently uh, located in the response plan that he was the guru and he was going to be, um, you know, come in and, and save the day if anything happened. Well, he had passed on several years before their plan was submitted. Um, so I'm not sure how that works. Um, they, they basically said that Deepwater Horizon well was, uh, well was 50 miles offshore, therefore it didn't pose a threat to the shoreline. Really? We had 3,000 miles in coastal Louisiana that were oiled, over 3,000 miles. Um, I think that the federal agencies must conduct more rigid reviews of response plans, and I know that some of the previous speakers hit on that, and I, and I agree. And I think the state um, ha has a role in there as well, so I don't want to uh, just point fingers. Um, the oil spill response technology, we need innovation. Uh, we're using technologies that were designed for the, for the, for the Valdez spill and for other um, uh, spills that, that this, you know, as noted, this is exponentially more oil than in any, uh, any previous spill, and, and, the, and the technology cannot be stagnant. We shouldn't be using decades-old technology for a spill like this. Um, a lot of people talked about the area contingency plan and, 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 and whether it was, it was appropriate. A plan's a plan. You're never going to be able to design the plan for the spill. The plan's a framework. It's all about implementation. You've got to train. You need to try and develop plans that are robust and have flexibility to respond to different conditions. But it's a plan. It's implementation that's critical. And the relationship between the federal agencies, the state, the responsible parties, it's critical. Doing drills and understanding the relationships, it's critical. So a lot of people focus on the plan. It's important, but implementation is critical. Uh, improved integration. I'm just going to leave the last bullet there and, and, and say it again that the responsible party shouldn't 
shouldn't run response. The, uh, the regulatory capture doesn't even describe it. It's ridiculous. So thank you. Thank you to all of our panelists for the broad perspectives and the detailed information. Um, I'm not sure that we really got an answer to the unifying question of what would be a single cause or the, the, the most important cause of, the, of the, um, the single factor that contributed to the magnitude of the event. And I think that that's indicative of the fact that it's very difficult to pinpoint just one thing. Um, but we have time for a couple of questions from the audience. And so um, let's go ahead and take that. Yes. And please announce your, your name and where you're coming from. Um, and, I, and I will repeat your question so it can be recorded for posterity. Just to briefly rephrase the, the question, I, be, I believe that the question is, is the fund going to be restocked? Yeah, is there any, because uh, we know there's a limitation of one day and it's about gone. Right. So my question is, is there any effort to figure out some way to replenish it, get some legislation passed quickly so that fund can be opened back up for more than a billion? Um, I think there's a 2005 legislative act that's passed that absolutely caps it at billion. And it's one billion per instance. I'm concerned as well as my claimants that we're going to be quickly out of money by the Coast Guard and be people have reimbursed the money and whether it's going to be any ability by the Coast Guard to pay claims in the future. Okay, so will, will, is there any intention to restock the fund or replenish the fund um, after, after it runs out? Or sure. Um, roughly about $1.6 in the fund. Uh, the, the numbers I have, and these aren't from this morning, they're, they're a little dated, but they're fairly fresh. Um, so far, the U.S. has spent about 876 million, so roughly 800 million still in the fund. Um, and BP has reimbursed or been billed. I don't have a breakdown for it, but they've been billed for over 600 million, and some of that has already been paid. Uh, so, if you just take the 800 million still left in the fund, and let's assume that BP's already paid half of what they've been billed, 300 million, we're still sitting at a little over a billion in the fund. Um, as far as Expanding the funds and more, yes, I, I understand there is some legislative proposals to do that. I don't know where they stand. And I also know, and you probably know more than I do about this, the third party co uh, con uh, liability claims have a separate <coughs> procedure set up and there was an individual appointed to handle those independent of the fund. And I don't, honestly, I don't know how that, I don't think that was actually envisioned in Open 90, but regardless, that's, what, that's what's been done. I don't know how that in place with the fund and whether that will provide some potential relief for your client. So let me add on a little bit to that because I think the, those two facts are very important have to have to be separated out. First, the, the billion dollar cap is on a single incident. The fund 
at, at this point, I know there's been um, several discussions on Capitol Hill as to whether um, it needs to be revisited, whether the uh, the per barrel tax needs to be increased to even increase the higher fund that it was done a few years ago because the fund was actually eroding money and now Deepwater Horizon side was projected to go up to 2.7 plus billion dollars. So in time it will go up, but they're really looking at what about a catastrophic event if this happens. But I think it should be remembered that the claims against the fund are those claims by natural resource damage assessment and um, and people who responded to the event, third-party claims are actually conducted between those individuals and the responsible party, BP. And so that there is a little difference as to who can actually uh, make claims against the fund. But assuming that the, the clients you represent uh, have a legitimate um, expense against the fund, then the first, the first order of business that they would, and you may have already gone through that, um, go through is to make sure that they have tried to exact payment from the responsible party, in this case, BP or Transocean or someone. If that's failed, then they go against the government. They weigh that They weigh that in. If the government feels it's a justified claim, they pay that claim. Um, and I don't know where that process stands in it or if there's a delay. I have not heard of any major delays, but I do know that they were not processing claims until they were getting information from BP. If in the event that they do pay that claim and it's a valid claim, then the government then seeks reimbursement from the responsible party themselves. They'll take that responsible party to court to get that money that they've paid out. You know, so so if BP says no, we're not going to pay you. Government pays, then they go after BP, and then ultimately all that money gets reimbursed back into to the fund and again against that against that billion dollar cap. I do. There were a couple issues that came out of this bill that were pertinent. Uh, one was the legal issue that even if BP put money back into the fund, let's say, let's say the um, expenses were $900 million and BP put every penny back into the fund, the amount of money that could come out of the fund was still only $100 million. It was not, it was not subtracted from the reimbursement. So that billion dollars per incident was a billion dollars no matter how much money went back into the fund. And therefore, the government was a bit standing into danger saying, we, by law, we can't exceed it even though there's money in there. And so, that, so the danger you talk about is a real danger if there's not a legal fix to that because once that billion dollars has been paid out, even if more money has come in, the laws that exist now did not allow for that, for that reimbursement back into the fund. There are some more there's certainly a lot more legal complications to that, but that kind of sets the stage for some of the issues that need a, need a legislative um, solution. And I know the Coast Guard's working hard. Capitol Hill is looking at that to say, and what, you know, how do we how do we account for that? There's a couple, uh, you know, I would ask everybody to, to pay attention to what's going on and, and make sure that they let their congressman and senator know their, their feelings on this because there's a couple of bills out there with different solutions as to how to solve that problem and whether they whether they get traction again uh, they've really been put on hold since um, the the um, the budget concerns but once once there is a budget and they move forward uh, i do know there's an interest in in some of the um, some of the senators and congress to, to move forward some of these solutions Okay, I think Juliet has a, a quick response yeah. as well, and then we'll break for... Very, very quickly, just I was calling around on this issue uh, in January, and basically, no, very few people are paying attention to this in Washington. There's no indication that Congress is going to lift that $1 billion cap. So, you know, again, inaction usually carries the day, particularly in this uh, partisan environment that we're in right now. So, you know, it would be an uphill battle to, to change that cap, although, again, if Congress felt compelled to, they could. Okay, well, that's time for and it's time for Sorry, a break. Thank you.